Lecture 27, this is our last lecture with new material for the semester. So the lecture on Thursday will be review. I'll primarily be reviewing the things that we've covered since the last exam. Um, don't get your hopes up about me just doing example problems the, the whole time. Um, I've done a lot all throughout the semester, so I'm going to be talking about conceptually how to understand and approach problems more so than just going through a bunch of example problems. Um, so your homework is due on Thursday at the beginning of class. Course evaluations are due on Friday by midnight, so please um, go do those if you haven't already for this class and for your other classes. And then our final exam is a week from Thursday, so be prepared for that. Show up on time. Make sure that you um, have your, your sheets ready and calculators and batteries and everything is in line for that. So today we're continuing our discussion of uh, renewable energy sources. So we're talking about the last three, which are hydropower, geothermal, and biomass sources. Um, so first, as we talk about hydropower, uh, similar to wind power, harnessing water and using the mechanical energy of water for purposes um, other than just you know drinking, have been used um, for centuries as well. So you can see there are some examples here of, um, of mills that are set up right on a river or other water source so that you can utilize the flowing force of the water in order to accomplish some sort of a mechanical purpose. Um, they were often set up near uh, mine sites so that ore could be crushed or rocks could be crushed or, um, or other uh, mineral purposes um, during uh, the gold rush in, in those times. Um, a lot of rocks and materials were crushed and then sluiced. So locating those mills and those, um, those facilities right next to rivers and waters was pretty important. Also because that was the sources, source of the gold is from the river itself. Um, they're also used to grind grain into flour. Um, they've been used as uh, sawmills. And then this is a picture of the, probably one of the more famous mills in this part of the country. Does anybody know where that one is? No, it's in Babcock State Park. So the grist mill in Babcock State Park is pretty, um, it's gorgeous, it's been restored and it's um, a beautiful thing to go see. So get out and enjoy your state. Um, so in more modern times, rather than using some sort of a mechanical wheel with water running through it um, in a very simplistic way where it's, it's just simply trans translating that shaft work into some sort of a rotational energy or, or a, a reciprocating energy. Um, hydropower is harnessed and by creating dams or reservoirs we're able to get even more energy potential out of these water sources by increasing <coughs> the elevation at which that water begins flowing through. So large dams in combination with turbines are used to generate electricity. So the source of hydroelectric power has to be some reservoir behind a dam um, that they're not often set up on free-flowing rivers or, um, or just any body of water. It, in general, needs to be a reservoir that is created specifically for the purpose of creating hydropower. And then the end result of that, or an ancillary result of that, is that there's also these reservoirs that are available for drinking water storage, they're available for recreation, um, for fishing, boating, other activities as such. So hydro turbines work by extracting the energy from the flowing fluid. It's run through a turbine, and then uh, if you attach that to a generator, you can then generate electricity. So if we look at the mechanical energy of a flowing fluid, there's three different components to it. Uh, this is the kinetic energy. This is the potential energy. And then this term here, does anybody know what that is? Potential. And this, is, this is potential. Yeah, this oh. is the flow energy. So that's here, flow energy. That the pressure differential between the upstream and the downstream flow divided through by this density term. Or we've seen it earlier in the semester as specific volume multiplied by that pressure differential is, is considered the flow energy. Is this in P2B1? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were gonna yeah, yes. Copy and paste. Okay. Yeah. P two minus P one. P two minus P two would be zero flow energy. So of course.
course, we don't want that in our equation. Whether we can have to change that. Okay. Um, so the sum of all of these changes allow us to uh, determine the mechanical energy change of this fluid. So if we are able to increase the elevation at which we begin um, harnessing this energy, or if we can somehow increase these flow velocities, or if there's a greater pressure differential between the inlet and the outlet, <coughs> then we can achieve greater mechanical energy results for our turbines. Um, and as with any device that converts energy from one form to another, we have to talk about efficiencies. Um, so for a turbine, our efficiency is equal to our desired outcome, which is some shaft power or some rotational energy that is, is coming from this turbine, divided by the mechanical energy that's available from the fluid. Um, and so we can look at this in alternate ways. We can say that it's the mass flow rate times that change in mechanical energy, so from the previous equation. Or we can say it's the mass flow rate times just the change in uh, potential energy, if that's all we're concer concerned about, um, which would also be equal to that, the maximum amount of energy that we would be able to get out of that flowing fluid or that fluid as it goes from zero velocity to some maximum velocity and from some height to um, a zero potential. Now, uh, a turbine in and of itself isn't always very useful because we can use a turbine to slow down fluid, and that's great, but there's not often many cases where we just want to slow down the fluid. We usually want to harness some energy. So in order to convert that mechanical energy change to an electrical energy, energy change, we have to use a generator. So the efficiency of the generator is equal to this electrical output that we get out of the generator divided through by our required input, which is the shaft work from the turbine. So this term that is our output from our turbine is our input to our generator. So if we want to determine the combined efficiency for the turbine and the generator together in sequence, then we just multiply those two efficiencies together. So the product of the efficiency will be the efficiency of the total system. And you notice shaft work cancels out. So it's our electrical output divided by our required input, which is the mechanical energy from the fluid. Okay, so the shaft work ends up canceling out of that equation. So we can look at each individual component, the turbine separately, the generator separately, or we could look at the system as a whole and we get the same results um, for those efficiencies. Uh, the elevation difference between a reservoir surface and the water exiting the dam as it enters the turbine is called the gross head. That's a weird term to me, but gross head is the, the total distance from the top of the reservoir to where it enters the turbine. That's just the elevation change from the reservoir to the turbine entrance. So if there aren't any losses, the maximum work that can be generate, generated for each turbine is going to be equal to that gross head term, or that significant elevation term, multiplied by the flow rate times the density times gravity. Okay, so you're just imagining that you're starting at some zero velocity at the top of that reservoir. All of that energy is being converted to uh, kinetic energy and it exits the turbine there. So that's your maximum maximum case is that all of your potential energy is converted into mechanical energy, into kinetic energy. Um, but even though you may have some, uh, some elevation difference between your, your reservoir and your turbine that's a set value, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to harness all of that potential energy and transfer it all <coughs> to kinetic energy because there's usually some piping involved, there's an inlet to the turbine, there's something called the penstock, um, which I don't have a picture of here, I do in the example problem, where usually you'll have a reservoir and there's a dam, and then there's some channel through the dam called the penstock that leads to the turbine. So the water is here and there's water here. Um, so there's some losses as it flows through the penstock because of the friction on the walls of, of whatever material it's flowing through, be it pipe, be it concrete. Um, there are, are, are losses that occur. Um, so we have to look actually at the net elevation gain, which is a result of 
these losses. So it'll be a lower value than our H gross. And when we calculate the maximum amount of work that we can get out from the turbine, we'll use this net value. Because if we calculate the maximum amount of work of the entire system um, and neglect any losses in the penstock, those two values would be equal. But because there are losses, and usually those are measurable, oftentimes they will be given to you directly in the problem, then you can calculate that elevation change or that net elevation change and see how it compares to um, the gross elevation change. So if we account for those losses um, in the components that are external to the turbo machinery itself. So these are not looking at losses within the turbine. It's everything leading up to the turbine. We lump those losses into a term called the head loss. Um, and so our H net is equal to this H gross minus the head loss. Okay, so we can substitute that term in there. Where sometimes this value is known and given this head loss term. Sometimes H net is known and given. It just depends on what you're given in the problem, which version of the equation that you would use. Um, any questions on this? So if you've had fluids before, this should be very familiar to you. Um, it's the same kind of analysis that, that you would do there. The main difference being that we use V dot and in fluids they use Q. Okay, so let's talk about different types of turbines. Um, an impulse turbine is one in which there is a flow that is um, impinging upon these turbine blades. And generally, they're kind of bucket-shaped. They're also sometimes called veins. Um, and so they catch the flow, and as they catch the flow, it causes this shaft to turn around. So the flow is parallel to the rotation of this turbine, that it, it uh, if you look at the velocity vectors, um, that it impinges uh, parallel to or tangent to this rotation of um, the wheel. And the design of these um, is often such that when the flow hits, uh, they want to minimize any, um, any losses that occur as the fluid is hitting that vein. So sometimes they'll have a vein that um, has like a little slit in it, so it's like a, a two-partitioned bucket so that it splits, the, it splits the stream and catches all of the fluid without having splashback. Because if you just impinge upon a flat surface, you're going to have a lot of splashback. If you have splashback, that means you're not harnessing the energy from that fluid. So if you impinge upon um, like a, a corner or a point, it splits the blade and then it's able to um, harness more of the energy um, from that flow that's coming in. Okay. So a, an alternate type is a reaction turbine where the flow is entering at a very high pressure tangentially to this turbine. So it enters, um, this is like a, there's a circular thing around uh, the turbine itself. So the flow is coming in in a radial manner, then it hits these blades and goes down. So there's two different types. There's the Francis type, which looks similar to um, like the... It looks like what you would see inside of a centrifugal pump, but instead of it pumping water, it's moving the blades. And then this one looks like what you would see in like a box fan or like a propeller on a ship. Um, but the, the Kaplan type or the Francis type, those are the two major types of reaction turbines. Um, and they have something called fixed guide vanes and stay vanes. So the fixed guide vanes force the water to go in a certain direction and they don't move. Um, and in many cases, the water may come in and then fill the veins before being channeled out um, and down through the turbine um, if the flow is not always uh, consistently steady. then that, that happens, so these veins can fill up and then it flows through these moving um, guide veins or wickets. So these are the wickets that are moving around. Um, so let's do an example, and this is what I was talking about previously with the penstock, that our reservoir is here, but we can't just put our turbine right here at the entrance to the reservoir because um, a lot of bad things could happen. We could suck fish into it or other wildlife, plants, debris, things like that. 
So this pen stock allows us to have some sort of an intake that can be filtered. So hopefully debris and animals and aquatic life don't get into the turbine. Um, so as a result of that, there are some losses as it goes through the pen stock, but um, that's better than having your turbine constantly break down because debris is getting into it. Okay. Um, so the piping efficiency of a hydroelectric turbine plant is estimated to be 98%. So they're saying that between here and getting to the, to the turbine, there's a 2% loss, essentially. So the efficiency of the piping is 98%. While the turbine efficiency based on the net head is 87%. So the efficiency of the turbine is 87%. And it says it's based on the net head because if it said it was based on the gross head, that would mean that you're already combining the piping efficiency and the turbine efficiency together. So these are now two separate terms. The, the efficiency of the piping is 98%. The efficiency of the turbine based on the net head is 87%. If we wanted to find the efficiency of the turbine based on the gross head, we'd just multiply those two together. But we also have our generator. So the generator efficiency is 97%. If the elevation difference between the reservoir upstream of the dam and the surface of the water exiting the dam is 220 meters, determine the overall efficiency of the plant and the electrical power output. Okay, so this is 220 meters. Distance here. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the overall efficiency of the entire plant. And similar to um, any other uh, system of devices we've done before, we can do the turbine generator combined efficiency would be the efficiency of the turbine times the efficiency of the generator, which is 98% times 87%. If we want to find the overall, we just add another term, so the efficiency of the piping times the efficiency of the turbine times the efficiency of the generator is going to be 0.98. Oops, this should have been 97. Okay, so 0 0.98 times 0 0.87 times 0 0.97. So the overall efficiency of the plant is those three terms multiplied together, which should be less then the efficiency of any one component. So if we put those um, together, we find that it's 82.7% efficient. So from the surface of the reservoir to the exit in the tailwaters, there's uh, a loss of about 17.3%. Um, okay. So our overall efficiency, part A, is 82.7%. Now, if we want to determine the electrical power output, W dot max is equal to rho G V dot times H gross. Okay, so that's the maximum. And then we're going to multiply it by the efficiency to get what it actually is. Um, so W dot max is equal to... Um, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed is our density of water, multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared, multiplied by our volumetric flow rate, which is 600 liters per second. I'm going to convert that into meters cubed per second. So I just divide through by 1,000, so it's 0 0.6 meters cubed per second. And our H gross, which is 220 meters. So this is what the maximum power output would be if we didn't have any losses. So 1293.6 kilowatts. We also have to multiply by one kilowatt is equal to 1,000 kilograms times meters squared per second cubed. Okay, so this is the maximum power output if everything in our plant was 100% efficient. It's not. So our W dot electrical is equal to the efficiency 
times w dot max, which is equal to 82.7% times 1293.6, which gives us 1069.8 kilowatts. Okay, so that's the electrical power output that we should be able to obtain from this plant, accounting for all the inefficiencies in the penstock, the turbine, and the generator. Any questions on this example? These are pretty straightforward, and they're very similar to what we've already done this semester. Um, we just have a few new um, components and details to worry about. So let's do another example. This time, rather than giving us the height of the reservoir, they tell us the pressure upstream is 95 PSIA and the pressure downstream is 15 PSIA. And that the mass flow rate through the turbine is 280 pound mass. Um, and that the efficiency of the turbine is equal to 86%. So we want to determine the shaft power output from the turbine and the height of the reservoir. Okay, so this is a little bit different problem um, simply because what we're given at the outset is slightly different. So in this case, if we want to determine the power output from the turbine, W dot max is equal to the mass flow rate times the change in flow energy from the upstream to the downstream. So P1 minus P2 over the density. So we find that it's 280 pound mass per second multiplied by 95 minus 15 PSIA over the density, which is 62.4 pound mass per second. No, per PQ, sorry, density. Okay, so this, uh, these units are kind of funky. They're in English, unfamiliar, a little bit uh, cumbersome to work with. So we're going to change it to BTUs. So one BTU is equal to 5.40395 PSIA times feet cubed. Okay, so this gives us a W dot max equal to 66.428. Okay, we could also look at this in terms of kilowatts if we wanted to compare it to other systems that we're familiar with. So we could convert to kilowatts by converting one kilojoule is equal to 0 0.94782 BTUs. So that gives us kilojoules per second, which is 70.09 kilowatts. So our shaft work is equal to the efficiency of the turbine multiplied by this W dot max term. So the max potential available to be converted into mechanical energy multiplied by the efficiency of that conversion process. We find that it's 0 0.86 times 70.09 kilowatts gives us 60.27 kilowatts. And you could do the same thing with it in BTUs and just determine what it would be in BTUs rather than Okay, so we know uh, part A, the shaft power output. Part B is the height of the reservoir. So we need to look for some equation that relates some of these power terms to height. And we look at, so W dot max, we can relate it to the pressure differential. W dot max is also equal to M dot times G times this H gross term. Okay, so that's the, that's the term that we want to figure out is the height of this, um, this system. So we can say that our uh, H is equal to W dot max divided by the mass flow rate times G. Okay, so here's where we can easily get lost in um, a nightmare of units. So I'm going to add another slide. Okay. So again, 
and H. H bros is equal to W dot max over M dot G. And we calculated our W dot max previously was 66.428 BTUs per second. So divided through by the mass flow rate is 280 pound mass per second times 32.2 feet per second squared. So that's the gravitational constant in English students. Okay, so we have BTUs, we have pound mass, we have feet. Ugh, it's starting to get messy. So I'm first going to convert back to something that's in terms of pounds and feet. So 5.4 Zero three nine one five. No, not one five, just five. Three nine five. PSIA is feet cubed over one BTU. Okay. So then I get zero point zero three nine eight PSIA. Feet squared times second squared over pound mass from these units. Okay, so BTUs went away. So PSIA times feet cubed, but I divide through by one of those feet, so I get feet squared. I've got second squared, I've got pound mass, those seconds cancel out. So PSIA times feet squared times second squared over pound mass. Okay, that's still not a unit that I can do anything with. What is PSIA? Pounds per square inch. Is it pounds force or pounds mass? Okay, it's pounds force per square inch. So I could rewrite this 0 0.0398 pounds force per square inch times feet squared and second squared over pound mass. Okay, you can't cancel pound mass with a pound force, but we can convert between pound mass and pound force using the gravitational constant. So 32.2 pound mass feet per second squared is equal to one pound force. So now we should be able to start piecing out what we need. So pound mass, pound force, feet goes here, goes cubed. Second squared cancels out. So now we have 0 0.0398 feet cubed over inches squared. Okay, so that's a unit of length. But we still have one more conversion to do. Yes. Where did the 32.2 go? Uh, it's uh, uh, 1.28. It dq per inch squared. So then we just have to simply multiply by 144 inches squared is equal to 1 square foot and we get equals 184.32 feet. And this is why everyone loves working in English units. <laughs> So, an alternate way to do it would have been to keep your units in kilowatts and just get it in meters and then convert to feet or something like that. But it's another lesson on just being careful with units, making sure you understand and check that things start canceling out. Because if you get to the end of the problem and you have, okay, it's 0 0.0398, 0 0.0398 feet, that's my answer, right? No, it's wrong. So, you have to check units and be diligent about TV track them. Okay. All right, so that's it for hydropower. We're moving on to geothermal energy, um, which is, I, I think, a pretty cool topic um, because it's a little bit um, mystical in a way, I think, this, this idea of that there's like all this bubbling magma down at the center of the earth and it's, we're just like standing on top of it, right? So there is a lot of energy at the center of our Earth, and it manifests itself at um, cracks or fissions within within the um, the layer that I can't remember the name of it right now. 
Um, so at uh, the tectonic plates, or where the plates meet each other, they're kind of just floating around that magna, there's usually areas of geothermal activity. Um, it can be manifest in terms of volcanic activity, where actually molten lava comes out of the ground. It can be manifest as steam seeping out, or uh, water, um, that there's many different, um, many different ways that it can be apparent that there is a geothermal activity going on in, the, um, in that location. So if we look at the United States, um, the majority of the hot spots for the geothermal activity are actually located in the western part of the United States. And that's because there are some continental plates that come together there. Um, and you can see that all of these dots on this map here represent as of, I think this map was 2015, um, the active geothermal plants that are in use within the United States. So you can see that we're capitalizing on a lot of these areas, but there's still very significant um, locations available that have a fair amount or a good source of geothermal energy. And I will bring your attention to this one here, where we are. Right? So that's a pretty favorable location for geothermal um, production. What are we doing instead? Cool. We're mining coal. Right. Okay. So there's an alternate, um, an alternate uh, source of energy for us there in West Virginia. Because we've looked at solar, and solar's okay. We've looked at wind. Wind is okay. But with geothermal energy, um, even if you don't have a very high temperature source, if it's in abundance, you can still make use of it. And um, it's, it's growing as a predominant source of renewable energy within the country. And there are some other countries that we'll look at and talk about um, that they just use almost entirely geothermal energy to power all of their operations um, in their particular country. So even though there are some spots that are definitely great and highly active for geothermal energy, um, we're not using all of them. Uh, some of them are in places where, yeah, you know, maybe mining is more predominant or um, for whatever reason they're not being um, utilized. But there's low quality thermal energy throughout the rest of the country. And there was an article I read a couple of years ago and I was trying so hard to find it again because it was pretty interesting. Um, that whenever they uh, go take core samples for a new coal mine or a new natural gas site, they measure lots of different things. One of them is temperature. And so um, these maps that, that are on the ELA website are based on um, somewhat generic surveys of the country, and they're not necessarily the most um, up-to-date or accurate based on actual geology samples. So they think they know what the temperatures are, but they haven't actually gone and taken a bunch of samples. Well, there was a researcher who was looking at all of these samples that were taken by mining companies, um, and he was starting to, to create a map, actually, of the Appalachians and the temperature profile underneath the earth, and that there is, you know, a fairly significant amount of thermal energy that we sit on top of, because it is fairly common that where you have coal or where you have natural gas, there's pressure and heat involved in creating those resources. So um, they often go hand in hand in those locations. Um, so there's a, a couple of different, some of them are not highlighted. Hydrothermal is the most commonly used source of geothermal um, energy. And it's naturally occurring at very high temperatures. And it can be a liquid, it can be a vapor, or it can be a liquid vapor mixture. So uh, if you've ever been to a hot springs, like a natural hot springs, that's water coming out of the ground at a high temperature. Um, if you've ever seen a geyser, you know, Old Faithful, or, or visited some natural geyser, that's water coming out of the ground at very high temperature. Um, so it's pretty cool and pretty interesting. Geopressurized sources are hot liquid at very high temperature and also at very high, high pressure. So they have a significant potential, both from a thermal standpoint and from a, a pressure standpoint, to do useful work. Um, however, it's a very dangerous source and volatile source of energy. So they aren't being tapped um, very widely currently um, because the technology is just not to the point where it can withstand the, um, the factors that, that come into these geopressurized sites. 
Um, one of them, so the temperature and the pressure are concerned, but another additional concern is that there's very high levels of corrosive materials that are dissolved within these high pressure, high temperature streams. Um, so trying to use any kind of a mechanical component within those sources often leads to failure simply because it's eating away at whatever you're trying to use to harness the energy from these sites. So uh, more research is, uh, is pending and, and moving forward in those types of sites. Magma is associated with volcanoes. Um, you can just imagine the energy um, of a volcano as it erupts, right? But that's just kilotons of energy being released into the air. Um, so again, another potential energy source that's widely available, however, quite dangerous, quite unpredictable, and difficult to harness. Um, and then enhanced sites are those where there's hot, dry rock in certain locations under the ground, usually near volcanic sites, but maybe, maybe uh, far enough away that the rock is not molten, it's just extremely hot. And so these enhanced sites are where uh, they would go in with um, some sort of a, a, a borehole and they would inject water into these hot, dry rock sites to create steam. So it's an injection process that's man-made to create uh, steam, it's not considered necessarily a natural resource and it's not used very widely. Most of what they do with it right now is experimental. So, But that is another potential source um, of energy from the Earth. So we can use these geothermal resources to generate electricity. Um, so as we've discussed in previous chapters, if any time there's a temperature difference, we can put a heat engine between those two temperature differences and generate electricity. So that heat engine can be of many different forms. We've talked about steam engines and we've talked about um, using other um, other working fluids or binary cycles that have maybe mercury and water running through them. So we can, we can create a, a heat engine, put it between those two reservoirs. Um, and in general, we want the temperature of that geothermal source to be above 150 degrees Celsius to get a, a, an efficiency that's high enough that it makes it worth our time um, and our, our economic um, investment in order to utilize that site for, uh, for generating electricity. Um, so it is possible to do it from lower temperature sources if they're in an abundant supply, but it's, it's better if the supply is at a higher temperature because it comes with a higher quality of energy associated with it which means that there's less entropy generated as you're utilizing it or using it. Um, because as we remember from the Carnot efficiency, that the maximum efficiency of any heat engine is based upon the temperature differential between those two reservoirs. That um, the higher the temperature reservoir, the greater our efficiency. We can also use geothermal resources for space heating. So in some cases, they take the geothermal water directly from the ground and they run it into a heat exchanger. So let's say the water's coming out at 90 Celsius, it's almost boiling. Um, they run it through a heat exchanger, which is either exchanging heat with another liquid source, or sometimes there's a refrigerant that's evaporated, or sometimes it's um, just air being blown across the, this heat exchanger. And it goes and um, can be uh, channeled or diverted into several different locations in order to heat buildings. Um, so this geothermal water that's used, um, if it's occurring as a natural source, so we can get it from the ground, then we, we develop these, um, these systems in order to heat buildings. But this is also commonly used with waste products that heat from other industrial applications. So if you have cooling water that's coming off of your system that's still hot, you want to remove the heat from it. You can do the same thing and uh, chuck some of that heat to the buildings. Uh, when I went to school there um, at Brigham Young University, they actually have steam tunnels that run underneath a lot of the university to, uh, for their HVAC facilities and things like that. And one of the interesting consequences of that is that the sidewalks um, don't really have to be shoveled in the wintertime because the snow melts off. So it's kind of nice, actually. Okay, so cogeneration is where we're generating electri electricity and heat. And this is uh, normally what's done with a geo geothermal site is that um, they're using some of the heat from that reservoir to heat other things. So be it um, heating and cooling for uh, a building or a facility, or maybe it's process heat that's used to, um, you know, 
bake something or cook something or refine something, that they can use this, this heat in many different ways and also generate electricity. And so they can do this in order to meet the demand of the grid. So if there's a, a, high, uh, a high draw on the grid at certain times of the day, usually like around 4 or 5 p.m. at night, there's, that's when the grid gets hit with everybody coming home from work, turning on their lights, starting dinner, um, that they can shunt all of, the, all of the resources into generating electricity. And then as the demand decreases, they can start creating more process heat that can be used for heating or those other applications. Um, an interesting challenge that we really don't get into in this class, but I think it's maybe even the biggest hurdle to overcoming um, our reliance upon our current standard of fossil fuels and how we do it, is um, the grid in this country. Because there's no energy, very little energy storage capacity in the grid, but they're always generating electricity to meet demand. So they can pump water up a hill and then let it drain at night to generate electricity and things like that. Um, and the turbines themselves in these big, huge um, power plants have some inertia with them. So if, if something happens and the grid goes down, but the, the spinning inertia, the turbines can still power the grid for uh, a, a short amount of time before um, it goes out. That's why sometimes the lights will flicker but not actually go out. Um, so with renewable resources, it's a lot more difficult to do that because you have to have these resources on demand. The wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. So in order to fully implement and, and take advantage of these resources, there has to be energy storage capabilities within the grid um, so that you can meet demand as it comes. Because we don't have big banks of batteries in every city that are storing this energy that can be used when it's needed. It's The plants are creating it on demand. Um, and I listened to a pretty interesting podcast about that, actually, a couple of years ago, too, um, which enlightened me on that subject. Okay. Um, so another, um, another way that geothermal resources can be um, the advantageous to homeowners is using ground source heat pumps. Um, because if you imagine your heat pump is sitting on the side of your house, and in the summertime it's 95 degrees outside, and you're condenser coils are in the sun and um, it takes a long or it takes much more effort um, and electricity to cool your home than it would if those coils related were um, located somewhere underground that was a constant consistent temperature year round so it doesn't freeze in the winter time it doesn't get overcooked in the summertime um, they can design it to be um, efficient and effective at those temperatures because most heat pumps, you know, we keep our house, let's say, at 72 year round. Um, the heat pump is designed such that our it, it can operate kind of well between a wide range of temperatures for outdoor temperature. So sometimes that's your TH, sometimes that's your TL. And because it switches back and forth in winter to summer, that instead of getting the best possible effective, efficient heat pump, you get one that works well for such a wide range. Well, if our temperature is always 72 inside and our temperature is always 50 whatever underground, it's much easier to design a very efficient and effective heat pump that operates between those two temperature limits. That you can design it specifically for that rather than trying to make it kind of good over a wide range of temperatures. So disadvantages of, of trying to implement this is, of course, it's much more expensive to try to drill and, and bury these lines. Um, they have to be at least a certain depth underground so that they can be at that stable temperature. Um, and in West Virginia, it's pretty difficult to dig a hole anytime because of um, our, our soil. Um, so it's, it's much more expensive, and you can do calculations that um, will allow you to know how much energy potential you can save over the course of you know, a certain number of years and then see how long it would take to pay back. And if the payback period is uh, longer than the, the expected life of the heat pump, maybe it's not worth it. But if it's within eight, ten years, something like that, um, then it's, it's a good thing. Okay, so let's talk about Iceland. I had the opportunity actually to visit there a couple of times. Um, and it's a really, really cool place. If you ever have the chance to go to Iceland, go. It's just, it's like no place I've ever been. Um, because you travel around this island and it's like in one place it's almost as if you're in this lush green 
you know, Ireland looking kind of place, and then you go somewhere else and it feels like you're on the moon because it's just this barren, rocky landscape. And um, it's called the land of fire and ice, um, primarily because they have a lot of geothermal activity. Um, and it's been used in Iceland for thousands of years for cooking, for washing, for bathing, and they even, that would be sometimes how they would um, execute people or torture people was throwing them into the hot springs. That there, we visited a place actually that was um, where they used to have their tribunals and if someone was found guilty they would just like push them off the edge into <laughs> the raging waters below that were like boiling. So kind of creepy. But um, it wasn't until the 70s that they determined to try to use this geothermal activity to actually generate electricity. Um, and the interesting note on that is that their first power station that they put in, in Bjarmerflog, um, <laughs> they had engineers from power plants in Idaho come and help them. So there's a collaboration between Idaho and Iceland where they were sharing um, technology and knowledge on how to implement these geothermal power plants. Because at the time in the U.S., Idaho was the majority of, of geothermal activity within the U.S. That's where the, the main um, plants and engineers and things were. And it is still a hotbed of geothermal activity. If you've ever been to Idaho either. Okay, so, um, so they had a lot of this geothermal resources, and it's, I mean, you just anywhere driving around the country, you just see like these steam pockets, and there's geysers, and just kind of a lot of cool stuff. Um, so they started implementing in the 70s, but you can see that between like 1975, 77, and 1997, so for about 20 years, they really just had uh, the two power plants, three power plants, and they weren't generating enough to meet the needs of their country. Well, they determined to put all of their, um, their resources in that one basket, I guess, in a way. They really, really wanted to eliminate their dependence on coal. Um, they don't have coal that is mined locally or enough coal to sustain a population, and everything is imported to Iceland because it's an island out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, northern Atlantic Ocean. It's cold. It's dark in the wintertime. They don't grow a lot of their own crops, and so they wanted to have something that was just self-sustainable, and that could be their energy production. Um, so in the last 10 years, they've completely eliminated their dependence on coal. So it's something 90-something percent of their energy in Iceland comes from um, these geothermal power plants that they've implemented. Um, a large majority of their, their heating and cooling comes directly um, from these geothermal plants because it's more efficient to use the heat directly to heat than it is to convert it to electricity and then use it to heat. So there's some losses in that transition there. Um, that they, most of the hot water that comes out of the tap is like scalding, burning hot <coughs> because it comes, it's not the direct water that's coming from the geothermal wells because that water is corrosive and has a lot of minerals in it, but it's, it's, it's the heat that's from those wells directly put into these pipes. And so it's like, um, People don't have water heaters in their home. They just get hot water that comes from the city in Iceland. So it's kind of interesting. It's really cool. It was fun to be there as an engineer and look around and be amazed. Yes? As, as like an average citizen, what kind of heating and energy costs is that compared to us? Like, is it cheaper or about the same? Um, they have a, a, so their cooling costs are almost minimal because even in the summer months, the highest temperature it gets is maybe in like, the 80s. Like we were there on a day, I was cold, it was like 68, and people were walking around in tank tops eating ice cream cones, and I was like, what? It's not that warm here, but for them that was their summer month. Um, so I wouldn't be able to speak necessarily on specifically how many kilowatts per person or you know whatever it might be, but I do know that this country, like most of um, European-ish countries, they're not Europe, but they're Schengen, so they're part of, um, you can go anyway. They use a lot less energy than we do in the United States, both in their automobiles and um, if they're cold, they put on a coat. They don't turn up the thermostat. If it's light outside, the lights aren't on in the house. They have windows. They have, you know, so they, they utilize the resources that are available to them that don't cost money um, because even though they produce all of their own power, it's very expensive to live in Iceland. So anywhere they can cut costs, um, that is something that they can change based on their habits is, is something that they do. 
So I don't know how it compares to the average American. Their homes are smaller, they're better insulated. Um, it's just, and it's different, and it's dark all winter long, so they have to have more lights on, but I don't know. It's very interesting, though. It's a cool place, and I like it. Okay, so that's it for geothermal for now. We're going to talk about biomass energy. Um, so biomass is any organic renewable source of energy. And when we're talking about organic, it's not the same organic as like your organic apples that you know are certified organic. Organic in the scientific terms just means comes from uh, matter that was once living. Um, so these fuels can be in solid, liquid, or gaseous forms that they can be burned or combusted um, in those ways. And in many cases, to produce the fuel, they are fermented and in sometimes to um, utilize heat from the fuel they are fermented. So combustion and fermentation, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the distinctions between different ways to convert these fuels. Um, and so they're sometimes intentionally produced. So there are crops that are grown specifically for being turned into fuel, like corn, uh, soybeans. And then sometimes they're byproducts of other industries. So maybe there's waste products that are generated as um, as lumber is being created. So there's wood pulp, there's cooking oil that comes from restaurants, there's um, a lot of other um, biomass that comes from just, you know, household production or, or commercial production as we use things and we throw things away, food or paper or grass clippings, whatever it might be, that can all be used um, and turned into a, a fuel or an energy source. Um, so these dedicated energy crops are perennial crops that grow back year after year after year, and they're harvested at maturity. So bamboo is an example of that. Um, there's other types of, of, of grasses and algae and weeds and things that grow continuously, and they're just harvested at maturity. So they're a perennial crop. That's, that's, they're a dedicated crop. That's all they are for is generating um, this biomass. And then there's agricultural crops that are grown seasonally, so maybe one year it's corn, one year it's soybean. And then there's sugars or there's oil extractives that are, are, are taken out of these crops. And then there's residues that are left behind from other agricultural operations. So maybe there's um, the corn shocks or the straw that's left behind after you cut the alfalfa, things like that that are also used as biomass materials. And then there's um, the residue for forestry operations that maybe there's dead or dying trees, or there's branches, or uh, wood pulp, or, or other things that are harvested and used um, for these commercial purposes. There are also aquatic crops that are grown, algae, kelps, and seaweeds, and these can be um, intentionally grown and harvested, or sometimes they're just harvested in nature. Um, processing residues, so any kind of wood chips or pulp, or, um, or whatever organic matter is left behind after some production, you know, when they make tomato sauce and all the tomato stems are left behind, you know, whatever, that they can turn, reprocess that and use it again. Um, municipal waste, so garbage, is used as a biomass source, and then animal waste from farms, and um, uh, that's an, another source, um, both to create gaseous forms, but also to be burned and used as a, um, a, a solid fuel source. So in order to convert this biomass into fuel, um, it needs to go through some process. So you can go chop down a tree, let it dry, use the wood, burn it in your stove, and that's a fuel source, right? So that's that's a fairly easy process um, to get that into a, to a usable source. Um, but there are other processes that take time and energy, and, and so it's never usually not often usually a, a one-step process like that. Um, so there's a biochemical conversion process where there's enzymes and microorganisms that break down the sugars, the yeasts, and then um, they, they turn into a product like ethanol. So corn, um, they have to first extract the sugars from the corn, and then they ferment that sugar to turn it into ethyl alcohol. Okay, it's a similar process to creating real alcohol, uh, but this is the, the fuel source alcohol that would make you blind if you try to drink it. Um, a thermochemical process is where they use heat and, and chemical catalysts in order to break down the biomass. Um, and so some examples of that, there's two processes called gasification and pyrolysis. Um, 
and I don't remember exactly the distinction between the two. I'd have to read it again. But um, it's a process by which they take these, these solids um, and they create either an oil or a gas that they can then use as, as a fuel source in an engine or to burn it. And then there's a photobiological conversion process. So this is what they do with a lot of the, um, the algae crops that they grow for biofuels, is that they can create, um, they can create an off gas just through this sort of photosynthesis. Um, it's not photosynthesis, it's photobiological, but um, rather than just creating um, the oxygen and carbon dioxide, or using carbon dioxide to create oxygen, they take the sunlight and in many cases, these algae off-gas hydrogen. So the hydrogen is collected and used as a fuel source. OK, so let's do an example um, where we're going to just see what it looks like to use, um, to use one of these biofuels instead of a, a regular um, gas or, or some other commercially available fuel. Okay, so this is um, an internal combustion engine that produces 200 horsepower when it's um, burning gasoline and it's 40% efficient. We want to see the maximum power from this engine if instead we use methanol under stoichiometric combustion conditions. And we'll assume that it's the same thermal efficiency, so if it's still 40% efficient, how much additional fuel are we going to have to consume um, to maintain the same maximum power operation? Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is balance our stoichiometric equation. And I'll just write down the balanced equation is C3OH plus 1.5 times O2 plus 3.76 N2. Goes to 2H2O plus CO2 plus 5.64 nitrogen. Okay, so that's the balanced equation. Um, so if we want to look at the, we want to look at um, the, the difference between the power consumption or the power generation, sorry, from this engine, if it's using methanol or versus um, using gas, we're going to look at the, um, this one, Oh, okay. Yeah, there's information down here too. That's why. So we know the air fuel ratio for gasoline is 14.6. So we need to calculate the air fuel ratio for methanol, and then we'll be able to calculate uh, how the, ma the mass of fuel ratios for those two by comparing their air fuel ratios with how much fuel is burned. Okay. So the air fuel ratio for the methanol is going to be the mass of the air over the mass of the fuel. So if we look back up to this equation, this is our mass of air. So it's 1.5 times 4.76. So the total number of moles is 4.76 times 1.5 times the molar mass of air, which is 29. And then the mass of the fuel is just this here. And so for this methanol, it's 1 times 32. Okay, so the, the molar mass of methanol is 32. Alternately, we could say uh, 1 times the molar mass of carbon, 3 or 4 times the molar mass of hydrogen, and 1 times the molar mass of oxygen and add them together. We also get 32. So this is equal to 207.06 over 32. So we find that the air-fuel ratio for methanol is 6.47. Okay, so if we're looking at the same engine with the same efficiency and the same volume, then this holds true. That the power output for gas over the power output using methanol, CH3OH, is going to be equal to the lower heating value of gas over the lower heating value of this CH3OH multiplied by the air-fuel ratio of the methanol, the CH3OH, over the air-fuel ratio of the gas. OK? 
okay, because the power is for the same volume is proportional to the lower heating value and inversely proportional to this air fuel ratio. So if we do that, we can find that the power output for the CH3OH is equal to 210.4 horsepower because our lower heating values are given there um, and our air fuel ratio for the gasoline is there and we calculate the air fuel ratio for methane. Okay, so that answers part A. The maximum power from the engine using methanol would be 210.4 horsepower. So it's slightly higher horsepower available using the methanol over using um, the gasoline. However, we want to find the rates of consumption um, and we have this equation that the thermal efficiency which is given to us in this problem is 100% uh, no, 40% 40% okay, thermal efficiency is equal to W dot out over Q dot in which is also equal to W dot out over the mass flow rate times the lower heating value times the combustion efficiency. So then we can solve for the mass flow rate for each case. So the mass flow rate is equal to W dot out divided by the thermal efficiency divided by the combustion efficiency divided by the lower heating value. So we would do that for each case. We would look at the mass flow rate of the, the, the gasoline. And so if we plug in the numbers for that, the mass flow rate of the gasoline, so we have a W dot out of 200 horsepower, these thermal efficiencies times the lower heating value, we have to convert from BTUs to horsepower, uh, to cancel a few things out, but we get, and you can look at the example. The mass flow rate of the gas is 1.15 pound mass per minute. Where the mass flow rate of the CH3OH is equal to 2.59 pound mass per minute. So we have slightly higher horsepower, but more than double the fuel consumption using the methanol. So depending on the cost differential between standard gasoline and methanol, um, you could also do an economic analysis and figure out whether it's worth it or not. Okay, um, so the biomass products that we get from these biomass resources um, are different fuels, so ethanol, methanol, which are synthetic and they're made from either starches or decomposing waste. This biodiesel, which is um, often combined with ethanol or methanol to make it usable in a vehicle. Um, the pyrolysis oil, uh, the biogas, producer gas, and synthesis gas. These are just all um, different ways that we use these biomass products and, and create these other um, usable fuels. Okay, so we can, we can utilize them either through di direct combustion, so we burn them directly to create heat, or we um, use a portion of these fuels in a uh, alongside a standard fossil fuel power plant to offset how much um, how much fossil fuel and carbon emissions we're generating. Or anaerobic digestion, which is where these biomasses are just essentially fermenting and then the methane is, is captured and converted um, from that. So there's a little video I want to show, and if you have to leave or whatever, um, you can leave. It'll probably take us a little bit over here to but. Um, Municipal solid waste. So if you think about trash day, okay, once a week, how much trash do you take out to the curb? Or do you do that? I don't know. Maybe you throw it in the dumpster every day. I have to take my trash out once a week. We do. I don't always do it. But um, <laughs> we used to have recycling, right? So the amount of trash I take to the curb now has significantly increased now that there's not recycling available to me, which is really unfortunate. Um, so we're just dumping all of this garbage in a hole somewhere. And period, full stop. That's, we're not doing anything with it. Okay, so there are things that can be done with it. And some of the reclamation sites here, the landfill sites, do, um, do collect methane. And that is one um, 
one way of, of utilizing the energy. But there are also ways where you can burn the waste directly and use it to generate steam. And these, um, these are unpalatable to a lot of us here in the United States. There are other countries that have implemented these changes and strategies and are having great success both with encouraging recycling, reducing their waste, and generating electricity. Um, so there are a lot of misconceptions about it. And I'll just let this video play because I think he does a very good job of talking about and explaining the process as well as some of the, the barriers to it being widely accepted. My solution to my most solution of my problems to my is to light them on fire. Them so on fire. why can't so garbage, why can't garbage one be one of those problems? Hi, I'm Julian. Hi, I'm Julian. Americans Steve make Americans a lot of trash. According, according to the EPA, in 2012, the average person makes 1,600 pounds of solid pounds waste of that solid year. Waste That's about 45% more than the average more European. European. About 55% of that goes in the landfill. So, so to translate that, if you're an average American, you are responsible for burying 880 pounds of trash in 2012. Is there something that garbage should be doing besides just Sweden thinks so. About 1% of Swedish trash ends up in the landfill. The rest of the so the rest is almost even between being recycled and burned for energy. Burned Sweden energy. actually burns Sweden so much burns trash, so they import 700,000 tons of it from Europe in order to keep the fires lit. And by using the heat to create steam, steam and run turbines, they get about 8.5% of their electricity needs from burning waste. Burning waste. Goran Skoglund, a representative of one of Sweden's energy companies, estimates that burned trash has about a third of the energy pound for pound and burned fossil fuels. Burning that trash means they save space in landfills, so they import fossil fuels, and, and as an added and bonus, they cut down on greenhouse gases. Green gases. Right. Stop right, right there because I, right there because I know exactly what you exactly all just yell at your computer screen. Screen. Julian, Julian, burning anything burning is going anything to create CO2. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're but right. like a Swedish but police drama, it's all very new. On the face of it, burning garbage actually looks less favorable than coal or natural gas in terms of CO2 production. According to the EPA, flaming trash creates 2,988 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. For the same power, coal makes 2,249 pounds of CO2, and natural gas makes 1,105 pounds. That doesn't sound good, but it's pretty good that a lot of CO2 released by burning trash is from stuff that was part of the Earth's carbon cycle. It's carbon that was in the air not too long ago and would be returning there again, whereas the carbon released in burning fossil fuels was out of the carbon cycle for millions of years, sequestered away deep underground. So the EPA considers the CO2 impact of burning waste to be about a third as bad as it looks. But energy from garbage unequivocally cuts down on a much more insidious greenhouse gas than methane. Methane now, doesn't stay in the atmosphere for hundreds of years like CO2 years can. Like CO2 Usually can. it's out and about Usually it's dozen. out and about But this little molecule this little is so good at trapping so heat, the EPA estimates one CH4 has 25 times the impact as one CO2 over the course of a century. And do you know what the third biggest source of methane is in the United States? Landfills. Yep, 18% yep. of, of the methane Americans make happens when we bury our trash and let microbes just go to town on it. Methane is a key component of natural gas, so some landfills have to sell it to power companies. You think the trade-off would be reduced methane for CO2, but the number one source of methane is natural gas and petroleum. So you don't get that methane in the junk, and as a bonus, you don't have to burn as much natural gas or coal. Double win. Flaming heaps of trash isn't as totally, totally glamorous as I'm making it sound, though. Like anything, it has its own point. It cuts down on greenhouse gases, but the trade-off is other pollutants into the air. Sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain, is released, along with trace amounts of mercury compounds and dioxins, which are highly toxic and build up in fatty tissues. Concerns over these chemicals are the main hindrance to adoption in the U.S., along with nobody wanting a trash-burning facility in their backyard when there's lots of cheap land. Sweden strictly regulates all these toxic by and even so, and plant so, representatives say that scrubbers reduce toxic, toxic chemical levels to half the legal limit. Some of these byproducts would still be present in landfills too, only they'd have the potential seep in the groundwater if the landfills are already part of the protective lining. Environmentalists who have been learning trash argue that the goal is to reduce how much waste they make in the first place and recycle more. And they're absolutely right. But there's no evidence that burning waste or recycling efforts. Sweden is expecting to step up recycling from 50 to 60% in the coming years, and they're 
only burning was a key. Even though the U.S. buries even though the US most, of most of our trash, we only recycle 34%. So, even though it's so, not glamorous it's not and not clear all for our refuse and energy woes, it looks like burning trash could actually be an important stopgap for climate change that became more widespread. Egypt deals with its junk in a rather unusual and interesting way. The Zet and the team at our sister channel Seeker cover that right here. Individuals push the cars to pick up most of the garbage. And the system works surprisingly well. Almost 90% of materials thrown away in Cairo are recycled. What do you fall on the burning trash issue? For it, hate it, have some reservations about it after choice theory 3. Let us know in the comments. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you next time on D News. about renewable